Good morning, church family and guests. We are so glad you decided to tune in with us. Um, we're going to sing a song and, uh, about welcoming the Lord's presence among us. He is here already. His spirit resides in us. But we are just asking him to make us just so much more aware uh, of his presence and his nearness. So let's sing this song and, as a prayer and as a, uh, just a cry of praise to the Lord.
Again, it is so good to have you join here uh, with us on, on this online service. I want to draw our attention to a scripture and it comes from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, uh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is such a uh, encouraging scripture because if you're anything like me, you can wear yourself out trying to be good enough for God. And the good news of the gospel is one, we can't be good enough, and but two, Jesus was perfect in every way and his cross satisfies God's uh, desire for righteousness and justice. And so we look to Jesus for that gift of grace that we need. And it's a Jesus alone that makes us right with the Father. So rest in that as we sing this song, as we lift our voices and, and worship our Savior through song. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. Oh, 
this. Lord, we look to you to be our guide and our light in this season, to be our strength and our hope. Uh, we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Alex, as I've been introduced. And I'm so grateful to God for this opportunity to come before you and share in the word of God. And I pray that after our little time together tonight, or today, that you will be encouraged, uh, that you'll be strengthened in your work with, with Christ, and above all, that we look forward to a new day with God being on our side. Tonight I come to speak to us, the title of my message is, Be on your guard. Be on your guard. And our text for tonight, we are reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Now for context, you can read verses 1 through 4. But for my discussion tonight, I'm going to focus on those two verses. And I'm reading from the NIV version. It reads like this. Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to him through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of, the, one of these little ones to stumble. You know, have you ever found yourself on a freeway and somehow as you're heading to destination, you run out of gas? It is a terrible feeling. Your anxiety levels can, in just a matter of seconds, rise from zero to 100. But how is it that someone can run out of gas on a freeway? You know, cars by design have instruments to warn a driver when something's going wrong. And on each, in each and every car, there is a fuel gauge it won't show you how much gas you have left, but by estimation, it will show you relatively what you have left. And before a car runs out of gas, the fuel gauge, the fuel gauge warns the driver. Right? So if you find yourself out of gas on a freeway, there are two possibilities. One is you never paid attention to your fuel gauge at all. Or if you did, you ignored the warning, right? In our world today, so many tragic things are happening. And when they do happen, we ask questions. Why did this happen? And if in the process of finding why it happened, we discover that it was foreseeable that this occurrence would have been avoided, then we switch our question from why did it happen to what did we miss? And examination or investigation into what was missed always reveals that prior to the incident, Prior to the tragic incident, there was ample warning along the way. But the people who were in a position to prevent the tragedy somehow didn't do anything. And so we found ourselves where we are, dealing with the aftermath of a tragedy. So, these two examples reveal one thing to us, and that is, as human beings, we are not out of warnings. Our problem is not that there's no warning. Our problem is that we never 
pay attention to warnings. And so as we go through our text and our discussion tonight, Jesus is warning us about something. And it's my prayer that we take this warning serious. It's my prayer that we take these warnings serious. Right? So before I go into the specifics of this warning, I want to talk about the relevancy of this warning. Who is Jesus warning? Well, Jesus was warning his disciples, but also he was warning all humanity. First, let's look at, let's look at his disciples. When Jesus came on this planet, he came to die for our sins. And he determined that his approach about going about eradicating sin was going to be through friendship. So he befriended everyone. He befriended sinners. In fact, at one time, he was accused of welcoming sinners. Right? So he came to die for our sins, because we're all sinners. But at the inception of his ministry, he was walking along the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two men, Simon and Andrew. He called them and told them, quote, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So the two men followed him. And as time progressed, he added more followers. So from two, now we had 12. And at some point, moved from 12 to about 72. And then the number of disciples grew. Jesus was training them on how to make disciples. And every disciple they made, they made unto Jesus. So when Luke tells us that Jesus said to his disciples, he is in essence referring to those individuals who were present at the utterance of this warning. But the warning is so broad to include followers of Christ who are not there in that time and space. Followers of Christ, including me and you. But also those who will come after us, after we have departed on this planet, after we go to be with the Lord. This warning is going to outlive all of us. And it was for the disciples. So Jesus was warning the disciples. You and I are disciples of Jesus. Therefore, we should take this warning serious. We should take this warning serious and make every effort to prevent the harm that we are being warned about. Jesus, in this warning, he was warning all people. And how is that so? If you look at verse 1, he says, things that cause people to stumble. The key word is people. The key word is people. Not just the disciples. So if you belong to this generalization of humanity called people, then this warning is for you as well. Because Jesus cares for you. Jesus loves you. Jesus wants you to be safe. Every warning has an element of scare. And we feel like someone is scaring you. But in this case, we are not being scared. We are being warned to be spared of harm. And every warning is about that. So he is warning people. And if you believe of Christ, he's warning you. If you are not yet sure, still he is warning you. 
You know, God causes the sun to shine on the godly and ungodly. He causes the rains to rain on the just and unjust. Just as that is true, even God's warnings are for those who believe in him and those who don't believe in him. So I pray, do not be so quick to dismiss this one because you may say, well, I don't believe in Christ, therefore I don't care. No, 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 I pray, do not dismiss this warning because it is for your benefit. It is for your own good. Jesus has a deep concern for your spiritual as well as social welfare. That's why he's warning you. So now, as we look at what Jesus is doing in this text, I mentioned before that he loves us so much. The Bible says that Jesus one time told his disciples, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends because I've revealed everything to you that I've heard from my father. So the revealing of what God is telling to Jesus, to us, he is doing so under the guise of friendship. He also said that there's no greater love than for a man to lay down his life for the sake of his friends. Again, he came to die for our sins, all of us collectively. That means he is our friend. He is friends with me. He is friends with you. Even though you don't believe in him, he is friends to you. Amen. His approach of dealing with our sin was through befriending sinners. At one time, he was condemned. The Pharisees accused him of eating with sinners, welcoming sinners. Jesus befriended sinners not to engage in their sin with them, but rather to rescue them from sin. He came to rescue us from sin. So what I'm going to do in this next moment, I am going to make an observation about friendship in this context, as the scripture reveals. Okay? Friendships. There are lessons in here that you and I need to bring in our interactions every single day. One, friends owe each other a duty of care. Friends owe each other a duty of care. What does it mean? So just imagine, if you're going through a serious, severe hardship, your world is unsettled. You're trying everything you can to alleviate the stress. But while you are doing all that, trying to be free of the pain, trying to be free of the stress, somehow you learn that your friend, your friend, your close friend, the one you hang out with, share meals together, share laughter together, share stories together, share secrets together, your friend, with whom you even have a common hope, you learn that this friend of yours knew about the things that contributed to your pain or your hardship. He knew the harm that would result, but yet all the time that you hung out together, he never took any moment to warn you. He never took any moment to alert you the fact that, you know what? There's something going to happen so that we would prepare yourself to either avoid the harm or even mitigate the impact. How do you feel about that friendship? How do you feel? Whatever you will feel, it will be because friends owe a duty of care to each other. So in this case, Jesus had knowledge about something inevitable that was going to happen. 
It was going to cause harm to his friends, the disciples. It was going to cause harm to his friends, you and I. And so because of the friendship, he felt the obligation to warn you and me. He felt the obligation to warn you and me. And he is warning us about sin. Well, as you see it and listen to me today, this warning is real. And you know it's real. But what are you going to do about it? Because you also have friends who need a warning. Are you going to sit back and just go on with your life? And if they get in problems, you go be alongside them, give them encouragement? Is it not easier for you to warn them now than to give them comfort in stress? So I pray that this lesson should calm our hearts, should speak to us, that we owe each other duty of care. But also in this text, there's something else that we can learn from Jesus. And that is candor or, friend, friend, uh, or frankness, candor or frankness are essential in true friendship. Candor or friend, uh, frankness are essential in true friendship. So here, Jesus is candidly warning his friends. He has no moment to sugarcoat what he's going to say. He even does not say it out of malice. He does not say it out of uh, self-preservation. No. He is telling them what's going to happen because it's going to happen. Right? He is candid. Anytime you lack candor in your friendship, two things are bound to happen. One, your friendship is going to be built on false expectations because you're not up straight with what you're offering or you expect. Right? Candor tells you or tells me that in a friendship, we have to be straight, we have to be frank, right? That way, there's not any overburdening of each other. We know what each one can afford to contribute to friendship. But also, on the other hand, if you have a friendship where there is some kind of conduct that's unbecoming, if that friendship lacks candor, I'll tell you this you will be sucked into participating in wrongdoing because you have no backbone to push back on something that is bad. So candor is essential in friendship. It holds true friendship together. It is a tool that I pray you and I should adopt. Amen? So the first lesson is friends owe a duty of care to each other. Second lesson is, candor is essential in friendships. It is essential in friendships. Now, the third is, friendliness is a solution to social ills. Before Jesus came on this planet, sin was ravaging humanity. The consequences of sin were, as, you know, were far-reaching, Right? that a person could sin, but the effects of sin could even affect those who are innocent. Take, for example, the case of Jonah, right? He disobeys God, goes in the ship, into a ship, and out of this disobedience, while he's in this ship, God causes a storm to come, and in the process, the other sailors who had no idea what was going on and they're becoming victims. Why? Because of one man. Because of one man, sin came into the world. And so, when Jesus came to die for sin, he came, he came with a mind of friendship. Because friendship was the only way he would uh, address us as humans, right? It's because through friendship, 
He would be able to identify with us. Right? So friendship is really paramount if we are going to get rid of social ills. In our day today, these first few months have highlighted the issue of racism in our world today, or in our nation. And many people are suggesting, you know what, we need legislation uh, to end racism, and that's okay. But you know, making legislation simply means you are adding complexity to a complex situation. And any time you add complexity to complexity, you're almost creating confusion. Could there be a simple answer to these problems? I think there is, and Jesus is showing us what it is. Because sin is a social plague. And racism, in my view, is a social plague, right? And they have something in common. What they have in common is simply this, that they are all, or they both emanate. They both rise up from the heart, right? And so to solve these problems, I truly believe the friendship or friendliness is going to be essential in dealing with racism. Friendliness has proven so far to be effective in dealing with sin, so it's not far-fetched that my assertion holds some substance. But again, let's try it out. Let's see the outcome. Friendship, friendliness is so important in our world today. Because friendliness is the only thing that can help a person overcome the fear of a stranger. Someone different for themselves. If you become friends, that fear will go away. So let's try it out. So now, I digress a little. Let me go back to the substance of our discussion. What is Jesus warning us about? If we want to find out what this warning is all about, we have by necessity, we have to be willing to travel back in time, specifically to the time during creation, when God created humans. In this case, creating man. The Bible says, God created man. He formed him from the dust of the ground. He breathed upon man, and man became a living soul. This act of creation established a relationship between God and humans. This act of creating man established a relationship between God and humans. But then if you read Genesis 2, down further, you find that God said, you know what? It's not good for man to be alone. He needs a helper. So God created the woman, Eve. So the creation of Eve in the story of creation means that God established a relationship between human and human, basically human to human. So we see in the creation of humanity, God did two things. He established a relationship between God and humans, as well as human to human. But for this to really flourish, there had to be boundaries to guide them. There had to be rules to guide their interactions. So Jesus summarized these rules for us this way. Two commandments that are designed to create boundaries on how we interact with God or relate to God on how we relate to each other. The first is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and strength. I have gone wrong with the order there, but that's what it is. Love the Lord your, love the Lord your God with uh, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second commandment was, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So when Jesus warns us that things that are things that cause people to stumble are bound to happen, 
he is referring to any attitude, to any thought, or any action that violates those two commandments. That's what it's about. And in this entire universe, there's not anything out there that can violate these two commandments except sin. S-I-N, sin. It's the only thing that can divide a wage between man and God, all human and human. Sin is the only way that can do that. So, Jesus is warning us against or about sin. Sin is always around us. Temptation to sin is ever increasing, ever present. So we have to be on our guard that we don't sin against God. We have to be on our guard that we don't sin against each other. But also in this text, he says, but woe to anyone through whom these things, sin, come. What anyone through whom sin comes. So in other words, we are also being warned about the consequences. So we are warned about sin and then about the consequences. There will be dire consequences if we give in to sin. Right? So it's prudent for you and me to avoid sin, to be on our guard. Also, as Luke read through the scripture, verse 2, it says, It will be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Once again, there's a warning in the second verse. And the key phrase there is, cause one of these little ones to stumble. This shows or reveals the nature of sin. Sin is contagious. It passes from one person to another, right? So Jesus is warning us to be very careful, not just about sin itself, but now, because it's contagious, we have to be mindful about who our friends are, even what we listen to, right? What we're being taught either their example or their doctrine, we got to be on our guard. If we are going to prevent ourselves from being misled or if we are going to avoid misleading others, be on your guard. And finally, Jesus is warning us about one reality, that temptation is going to be around us till we go to be with our maker. So don't take things for granted. Be on your guard. Temptation is all around us. Wherever we go, you can switch locations. It doesn't matter. It will still be there. It will still be there. So we have to be on guard. Now, why is Jesus warning us? Yes, we know about the the sin issue, we know about the consequences. Why is he warning us? And I'm going to propose two answers that are not explicit in this text, but I believe they align with avoiding sin. One, Jesus is warning you and me so that we don't become complacent. You know, many times as Christians, when you read your Bibles, when you go to fellowship, there is a feeling that comes and overtakes us where we feel that we have made progress in the Lord, which is true. But sometimes that feeling may be overblown, whereby we become so content to begin ignoring the things of God. We become complacent in a way, right? And in those moments, we are vulnerable to sin, right? Complacence is dangerous. We don't want to be around us. So be on your guard that you, don't, you do not become complacent in your work with God. 
But also, Jesus is warning us not to be presumptuous, right? Presumptuous simply means this, that we get so contented that we begin to overstep our boundaries. So God gives us an instruction to do something and do something probably opposite to what he told us to do. Trying to get the same, meet the same objective, but with different means. I'll give an example. In the Bible, we know of Moses, who was a mighty man of God. Moses had seen so many miracles. God used him so mightily. But God told him to go and speak to a rock. Moses went, and because of his overassuming nature, he didn't do what God told him to do. He didn't speak to the rock. The rock. He didn't speak to the rock, right? Instead, Moses decided he was going to strike the rock. That's what he did. Overassuming God, striking the rock, and speaking, the, speaking to the rock are so different thi- two different things, right? But yet Moses failed in that endeavor. And because of the presumptuousness of this sin that he committed, God did not allow him to lead the people in the promised land. So presumptuousness will in some way take out God's favor from us. It is a sin. So we have to guard against it. We have to guard against it. So, we have had this warning from Jesus. We know it's relevant to us because he's speaking to you and me. We also know that in this conversation he's having with the disciples, there are the lessons that you and I need in our friendship, either be it with God or with each other. We know this one is about sin and temptation, all we need to do to avoid sin. What then should we do? We have heard it. It's clear. What then should we do? I'll submit to you that when Jesus made these statements, he was on his way to Jerusalem. He was going through Samaria and Galilee to Jerusalem. And not long after that, Jerusalem entry, would he be crucified. So he made these statements or this warning before he died on the cross. Okay? That means the perception or the drive to heed the warning might be different if you were there at the time during the warning. But now we here today are reading this post his death, burial and resurrection. So in other words, we are reading this warning after he had died for our sins. So then what do we do? I think the effort we have to put into overcoming sin has now to be redirected. Why so? Here's why. Jesus left all his princely glory. He became a human like us, come on this planet. He showed us how to live by his example. Here he is warning us what to avoid. And he died on the cross to take care of our sins. Right? We see in Jesus a person who is all-knowing. He knows the past, and in this case, he clearly knows what is going to happen in the future. He's not second-guessing. He's just saying it's going to happen. It's inevitable. So he has this all-knowing capacity or ability, right? He's able to know things. Right? But also, 
we know he was human like we are, which means that he knows our weaknesses. He knows our struggles. He was tempted like we are tempted. Sin and temptation was always around us. And was always ar around him. So there's nothing new they can't understand. Right? So if he knows everything, if he knows our weaknesses, and if he is the answer to sin, what should we do? I will submit to you that among all the things, the primary thing that we can do is simply this. We bring ourselves to give our lives to him. Bring ourselves to fully, not partially, to fully give our lives to him. And after giving our lives to him, we should command ourselves to follow his instructions, to follow his commandments. That's the only way we're going to overcome sin. Temptation is around us. Right. It won't go away. It will always be where we are. But if we're looking to Christ, if we're trusting him, and if we are obeying his commandments, he will enable us to overcome temptations. The Bible says that he was tempted like we are tempted. And when temptation comes our way, God is faithful. He will provide a way of escape. He will provide a way of escape. So you and I have an obligation is to look and see what God is doing, what doors is opening for us to escape sin. And if it is that we cannot see those doors open to escape or run away from sin, we can say this one prayer. God, open our eyes that we might see the door to escape sin. God, open our eyes that we might see the route, the door that you have opened for us to be able to escape sin. And this God that we believe in, he is faithful. He will reveal to us. He will show us those doors. And I pray that when the doors open and we see them open, we will have the strength to walk through them. In instance, let's be on our guard that we do not miss seeing those doors open for us to flee from sin, for us to run from sin. And with this, I thank God for you. I thank God for the time you have you know, taken to listen to me. And I pray, and I pray, even as we depart, you will take some, will take some time to think about this text. Read it over and over again. Perhaps God will show you some things I've even shared today. There is so much in there, in this text. But all in all, I just pray that we should take this warning serious. We should take this warning serious. Be on your guard. May God bless you. Well, a huge thanks to Alex for bringing the word today from Luke chapter 17. Um, I just want to remind you all right now, we are about to have a family meeting on Zoom. So if you're on our email list, you would have gotten that uh, invite, the information on how to log in. We have some really exciting things uh, that we want to share with you, uh, both about our reopening and about uh, some of the things that are happening in our building and others as well. So uh, please go ahead and, and as soon as you're done here, go ahead and log on there. If you didn't get that info, you can send a us a message right now and we'll get that to you. And just in about five or 10 minutes, we'll be starting 
uh, that family meeting. So God bless you all. If you're not able to make it, have a great week. Uh, but for the rest of you, I hope to see you in just a few minutes. worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. And see what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free, free captive, and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken in life. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great been faithful through every storm. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. Yes, you have. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh, God, you do great things. You conquer the grave, you free every captive, and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken oh, alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lives in I, oh God, you have done great things. Oh, hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Yes, you have. Oh, hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken life. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great Oh God, you do great things. You've done great things. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We are so grateful you joined with us today. God bless you guys, and God be with you this week.